We're reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or anything but that we should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular so love in his, his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I want to say uh, I was impressed with our uh, rooted camp. Uh, the, the young men who, who led the camp, the teachers I'm talking about did an outstanding job, Noah and JP and, and, uh, and several others that came in there, but uh, Dennis Smith, the three of them did an outstanding job and then there were others that did more. I was really impressed when the very first lesson that I saw from JP Gulledge had to do with the difference between exegesis and asegesis. And I thought, these 12 year olds have probably never even heard those words before. And that's true, they hadn't, but they know it now. They know that Exegesis means you're taking from Jesus and you're sharing that. It comes out of Jesus. Asegesis means away from Jesus, and it means you're teaching things on your own and away from what the Bible teaches. And they understand that. Isn't that right, Jose? He said, yep, he knows that. By the way, I got to see the, the power of our Lads to Leaders program. There were eight young men. At one time there were ten young men, but there were eight young men that were delivering lessons and stuff, and, and it was pretty obvious, the one there, that had participated actively in Lads to Leaders because his skills in song leading, his skills in, in teaching and preaching were, were far and above, and, and, and I appreciate Jose. He was, he was outstanding there. Uh, one of the quotes that I took from it that I want to share with you before we begin the lesson, as the young boys were learning song leading or learning how to lead a song, and uh, the fellow was up there teaching him how to, how to lead a song. He said, make sure you sing loud enough for everyone to hear you because you don't want the congregation to drag you down. And I thought, wow, now there is a, there is a very real statement. We don't want people to drag us down in any aspect of our life, right? So he told them to make sure that they lead in such a way that they not be drugged down. We're here this morning, we're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about a marriage that honors God. Uh, uh, I read the story about a young lady, and she wanted to go to college, but her heart sank when she read the questions, and, and she got to a particular question on the application. Are you, or do you, consider yourself to be a leader? Being both honest and conscientious, she had to admit that no, she didn't consider herself a leader, so, so she, she wrote no and submitted her application and, and waited, expecting the very worst. To her surprise, she received the following letter from the college. Dear applicant, a study of the application forms revealed that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We're accepting you because we feel it's imperative they have at least one follower. You know, there's times for all of us to lead and, and things like that in our lives. And, and sometimes, though, we get so focused on leadership, we forget that our very first responsibility is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. 
And I think sometimes we lose track of that and we, and we don't understand where we're supposed to be because we lose track of what we're supposed to do. The very first command Jesus gave to his apostles was to follow him. And, and, and the same is true for us. There's no way to be a successful Christian without following Christ. And that applies to every part of our lives. This morning, we're going to notice God's view of marriage and that it contrasts that God's view of marriage is very, really far different from that of the world around us. It's, it's totally different. There are, there are several in our congregation in this, this morning who are not married. And I understand that you look at it immediately and you say, if you're going to talk about marriage, I can zone out. I don't have to pay any attention. But the principles and the precepts are still valid for all of us. And two, you have friends who are married and sometimes they need help. And sometimes they need somebody who can encourage them. And so hopefully this will help you as well. There are others who wish their marriage was a little stronger. And maybe this lesson will help a little bit in that area. I, I hope so. But, uh, but what we're going to notice is that, that God's view is so different from the world's view that it almost is contradictory. Oftentimes couples get nervous during their wedding ceremony. Anybody that's ever participated in a wedding ceremony or, or performed a wedding ceremony, if that's what you want to call it, they, uh, they can tell you of all kinds of incidents they've seen and all kinds of, of, of stories they've seen. I notice that the bride and the groom are usually very nervous, and, and I don't know why it is, but young people, as you're planning your marriage and you're planning that unity song, don't pick out a 15-minute song you are going to rush, even though you're going to try to be dignified about it, you're going to rush down, you're going to kiss your mom and kiss his mom and whatever it is that you're going to do, you're going to light your candles, and you're going to be back up here in 12 seconds. And the song is still going to be playing for 15 minutes. And you're going to be looking at each other thinking, good grief, I wish this would be over. And if I'm doing the wedding, I'm going to hold up a piece of paper that says, it's not too late because I'm trying to help you get past your nerves because you're going to be nervous. It's normal to be nervous. The story's told of this one couple and, and the bride just started giggling. She got the giggles and that happens sometimes and, and sometimes they get the tears but this particular case she got the giggles and, and he tried to get her to repeat after him and he says, till death do us part and she started giggling and she couldn't do it. He said, oh come on, let's, let's, let's try this again. So he says, till death do us part. And she started giggling. He says, till death do us part. And she just burst into, into laughter. And so the preacher finally, his, uh, he, he finally looked over at her and he said, well how about for a few years anyhow? <laughs> and after she got her laugh out of the way, she was able to go ahead and finish her vows. But sometimes that happens, you know, that we get nervous about things and, and we start thinking about that. But we're going to look this morning that one of the most significant cornerstones of a strong family is two people who've decided to make their marriage last till death do they part. You know, uh, a husband and wife that are trying to make their life, their life last, trying to make their marriage last, trying to make their legacy continue, and how important that is because... You see, that's part of God's plan for marriage, and that's what we're going to look at. Uh, many years ago, when I first started preaching about marriage, I began with a certain premise. And, uh, and it, was, it was something like this, that strong Christian families begin with a husband and wife who are committed to each other. Sound like a good premise? Strong Christian families begin with a husband and wife who are committed to each other. And I, I believe that, and it seemed reasonable, and after all, isn't that what marriage is all about? So I went to my Bible's computer program, and I looked up the word commitment. You know how many times the word commitment is found in your Bible? It's not. It's not in the King James Version, it's not in the American Standard Version, it's not in the NIV, it's not in the ESV. The word commitment is not in your Bible anywhere. Nowhere does it say couples need to have a strong commitment to each other. That was kind of scary, but I don't give up easy. So I looked up the word commit. And you, saw it, you know what I found when I found the word commit? Talks about committing sins, talks about committing adultery, talks about committing crimes, talks, oh, wait, well, and, and sometimes it says don't commit, but that's what it says about commit, and I thought, well, that's not what I'm really looking forward. But 
Then I found two passages that really made a difference. Proverbs 16 and 3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Now that has to do with marriage. If we commit to the Lord whatever it is we do, our plans will succeed. So that's where it starts. And then in Psalms 37, verses 5 and 6, we'll come back to this a little bit later. He says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. This is what he'll do. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. If you'll commit your way to the Lord, God will make you shine. Now doesn't that sound like fun? Doesn't that sound like what we really want? You know, when I read those, I knew I had to change my premise. Because the more I think about it, the more I realize a strong Christian marriage is not based about our commitment to each other. It's based about our commitment to God. It's based on our commitment to God. That's where it begins. It's, it's not the commitment two people have together. No, it's actually the commitment that the husband and wife have to God. You see, it's not between two people. A marriage is between two people and God. In spite of the courts, in spite of laws that change in our country, in spite of all kinds of things that try to redefine what marriage is, marriage is a religious term that God put into play in the Old Testament. And marriage is defined by God as the relationship between one male husband and one female wife for one entire lifetime, whichever one it is that comes first. That's God's plan for marriage. And he made it very clear, and, and, and we may want to change the rules, but you know what? You can say that baptism consists of sitting in a pew standing on your head, but it doesn't change what it really is. It doesn't change what God has said. God says baptism, immersion, complete submersion. That's what we understand because that's what he said. And why would we think anything different about marriage? By the way, while we're, while we're on this, there's a, there's a pet peeve of mine, and, and you can ignore this, or you can laugh at it, or you can say, I agree, I, don't, I, I really don't care. It's just one of my pet peeves, and I want to get it off my chest. Dr. Laura Schlesinger defines engagement about the best of, I, best of anybody I know. If you've got a ring and a date, you're engaged. If you don't have a ring and a date, you're shacked up. And I think it's time that we admitted in society that even those that are living in sin quite often would like to t call their relationship something holy. But we need to call it what it is. It's not, it's not an engagement when you're not... I'll quit preaching on that part because that's, like I said, that's my opinion, that's my pet peeve, and, uh, and, and we'll just go with that. Years ago in college, this isn't the right professor, by the way, I watched a, a video as a counselor who was teaching the class drew on a chart on a piece of paper and he was talking to a couple that were having marriage problems and he explained that when couples are dating they're drawn together by a number of factors there's all kinds of number of factors there's physical attraction they like the way the other one looks they like the way the other one tastes when they kiss those are the physical attractions that, that draw them together. They have common interests. They like the same kinds of music. They maybe have the same tastes in art or movies or something like that. But primarily, they're drawn together because they make each other feel good about themselves. There's a really scientific term for that. It's called warm fuzzies. <clears throat> they give each other the warm fuzzies. Uh, but when the couple gets married, over time, even in the best of marriages, a husband and wife can get to the point where they don't feel warm and fuzzy about each other all the time. And so maybe they get a little irritated with each other and they begin to argue over all kinds of issues and, and, they can't, and maybe they begin to take each other for granted. Or maybe even they begin to misuse or abuse each other. The bond that once held them together is not there anymore because they've gotten out of the habit of giving each other warm fuzzies. They've gotten out of the habit of showing each other how much they care. And when this breakdown in their relationship occurs, it's hard to talk to them about commitment. It is hard to talk to them about committing themselves to each other when they feel like trust is gone in the relationship. 
It's hard to talk about committing to someone when you feel like they're not committed to you. And so it's very difficult for them when the commitment is broken and the trust is broken. Maybe that's why I couldn't find it anywhere in the Bible, the word commitment. But the Bible does talk about wives respecting and submitting to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. The Bible does talk about husbands loving their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. The Bible does talk about those kind of things, and that's what commitment is. But it's a commitment based on our allegiance to him, not based necessarily on our relationship to one another. Ephesians 5.21 opens up the passage that was our scripture reading this morning about marriage with these words, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do you see what he says? Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ, not because they deserve it. You don't, husbands don't love your wife because she deserves it. You do it because you have reverence for Christ, not because that will make you feel good. Oh, it just makes me feel so good to submit. I've never heard anybody say that before in my life. I haven't. Not because you love them. You don't submit to one another because you love each other, but because you're committed to Christ, because you love Jesus. You see, if our relationship's based upon the relationship with Christ and our marriage relationship falls under his headship, all of the rest of it will fall into place. All of the rest of it will take care of itself if we love Jesus first. But if we don't love Jesus first, none of the rest of this is really going to matter because you know what? There is going to come a time when they don't deserve it. There is going to come a time when it doesn't make us feel good. There is going to come a time when we're not going to feel very loving toward them at that moment. There is going to, oh wait, you see if we're committed to Christ, none of those others really matter. None of those others really matter because we'll come back to them if we're committed to Christ. My wife and I, oftentimes, I'll tease her, and she'll say, I love you, and I'll say, I love you, too. And she said, you better. And I said, well, I have to. It's a rule. <laughs> well, it is. It's a rule. It's not that I have to because it's a rule. It's that I want to. But it is a rule still, whether I want to or not. And we need to understand that in our relationship. It's a part of what, what living is all about in Christian living. Now, the counselor that I was talking about he, he wrote a few other lines on that piece of paper in that class I was taking. He pointed out that God recognizes that sometimes the husbands and wives don't get along. But we have an edge as Christians. Because first, our focus is on God. Above and beyond our relationship with each other. That comes first. And so because of our relationship with God, it causes our relationship with each other to be a little different. And two, the closer we walk with God, the closer we get to our spouse. I, I use the illustration quite often in counseling that, that if two people are apart from each other, no matter what it is, the closer we get to God, the closer we get to each other. You ever notice that? It just, it just happens that way. You can't help it. The closer we draw to God, the closer we draw to one another. And so, so we need to understand that. And, uh, but it only works if we're looking to follow God's way. Psalm 37, 5 through 8. There's a, there's a passage there that I want to look at for a, for a few minutes this morning. And, and, and let's look at this. It says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the new day sun. That's what we've already read. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret. When men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes, refrain from anger and turn from wrath, do not fret. It only leads to evil. This passage has three parts to it. First, there's a promise. He says, the promise from God is, he'll make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. You know, it's based on a set of conditions. Commit your way to him, verse 5. Trust in Him, verse 5. So if we commit our ways to Him, commit our plans to Him, and we trust in Him, He's going to make us shine. So how do I do that? How do I commit my ways to Him? Well, in verse 7, He says to be still and wait patiently for God. 
In verse 8, he says to refrain from anger. And again, in verse 8, he says, do not fret. Some of your translations say, don't worry. You know, and, and so that's part of it. Most Christian marriages fall apart because either the husband or the wife quit trusting God. You say, oh, no, it's because we fell out of love. It's because we quit trusting God. Because we quit following his plan. Because we quit following his precepts. They failed to wait for him. And because they're unwilling to wait for him and trust him, they allow their anger to get out of hand. Or they allow themselves to fret and worry to the point where they just say, you know, I need to take matters into my own hands and, and do this myself. And, 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 and when we do that, verse 8 says, it leads only to evil. By contrast, God says when our hearts are right, then he's going to say, because he loves me, you know, if, God, if, if, if he loves me, I'll rescue him, I'll protect him, for he acknowledges my name. That's what God says. If we love him, he will protect us. Because we acknowledge our, his name, he will answer us. Psalm 91. I love that. If we'll acknowledge him, he will answer us. In other words, if we do things God's way, everything's going to turn out okay. God's going to deliver us. God's going to rescue us. God's going to protect us. But only if we're willing to obey him and wait on his timing. A couple of years ago, Linda Waite and Maggie Gallagher wrote a book called The Case for Marriage, Why Married People Are Happier, Healthier, and Better Off Financially. And they revealed all kinds of statistics in their book it, that pointed out some of the practical reasons why people should never get a divorce. Here's something that's intriguing about their statistics regarding bad marriages. We like to hear about those, right? Everybody likes to hear about bad marriages. Here's what they found out. They asked this question, what happens when a bad marriage doesn't end? What they found out was fairly shocking. Among couples who originally reported their marriage was very to extremely unhappy, when they interviewed them again five years later, 77% of the very unhappy marriages now called their marriage either extremely happy or quite happy. Well, that's quite an improvement there. So in other words, even if I'm not a Christian, even if I'm not a Christian, if I'm trying to be patient, if I'm willing to wait, if I follow God's way, my marriage may turn out okay anyway. I want to tell this next little illustration without trying to, to give away who or what or anything like that because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But, but Gail and I know a family where the, the wife was unfaithful to her husband. And during her unfaithfulness, she became with child from someone else. And I remember counseling with the fella, and he says, the day that baby turns 18, I'm out of here. But I will stay with her to raise that child because the child deserves that. Quite a commitment from a man. Quite a commitment from a man. From a man. It's been, don't want to say how many years, but more than 30 since then. He's an elder in the church. He and his wife and their children that they've raised, including that young daughter, are as happy as any couple you've ever seen in their life. Yes, it was hard. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, he had every right to throw her by the wayside if that's what he chose to do. But he chose instead to try to stick it out. And as he followed God, he found out he had to love her. And he grew to love her just as much, if not more, than ever before because he had learned to love her in spite of her warts. And their relationship is stronger today. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we forget about that. I think sometimes we forget about God working actively in our marriage if we'll let him. So what are those tools? Here's the tools God has. These are the tools for a perfect marriage. You want a perfect marriage based on God's plan. Wives, submit to your husband by respecting him, whether he deserves it or not. Respect him. Give him respect. And by the way, sometimes you have to encourage him to be respectful. I remember my wife coming to me one time saying, I know you pray because I hear you pray sometimes, but why won't you pray with me? And then, I know you read your Bible, but why won't you read your Bible with me? So now we pray together and we read our Bible together every single night. I needed a little encouragement. 
And as a result of the encouragement, maybe it makes it easier for her to submit and respect. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for. You know, that is just as valid. I think sometimes husbands think we get off easy because, because wives have to submit and husbands just have to love. Let me tell you a secret, guys. It's a lot harder to love than it is to submit. I spent my time in the Navy and I submitted all the time. It was you go here, you do that. You stand here, you do that. You sit here, you do that. You have 20 minutes and 20 minutes only to eat. You know, and you understood all the rules and you knew all the rules. You wore the clothes they told you. I submitted all the time, but I didn't love all of that. Loving takes effort just as much as submission does. And I think sometimes we allow ourselves to get off too easy by saying, well, they've got to submit. All I have to do is love. No, loving is Jesus showed his love by dying on the cross. That's how he showed his love, demonstrated it to us. From what I've observed, is those are the areas where we have the hardest time. Men have difficulty loving their wives and treating them like they ought to, as gently as they ought to. And women have difficulty respecting their husbands like they ought to sometimes. Stories told of a little boy and a little girl. A little girl says, hey, do you want to play house? And he said, well, I don't know, I guess. And, and uh, he says, do you want me to be the, the dad or the brother or the, or the son? And she says, well, she says, I want you to communicate your feelings to me. And he says, well, I ain't doing that. She says, okay, you can be the husband and I'll be the wife. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about that. We, 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 don't always, we don't always communicate very well our love as men, and our wives sometimes have difficulty respecting us as they ought to for the same reasons, because that's how we are. That's why God told us those particular rules were the rules for marriage. Wives, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. We need to understand that. Uh, Back in 99, Syracuse University interviewed a large number of married couples. They asked, what do you want most out of your marriage? Guess what the number one response was among men? Respect from their wives. Number one from all the men of the marriages, respect from their wives. Men indicated that when their wives made them feel capable or as proud of them or willing to follow their lead, it made them feel better about themselves. Guess what the number one response was among women? That their husbands would love them. That their husbands would love them. That was it. Affection from their husbands. Guys, you need to court your wife. Remember when you were courting her in the first place and trying to get her to marry you? You didn't show up in your old wore out clothes, sweaty from working out in the yard and say, hey baby. No, you didn't. You went in. I, I've, Alan and I have traveled together enough to, that I know this is true. I wasn't there, but I guarantee you this is true. Before Alan went by to pick up his lovely young girlfriend before they were married, I guarantee you he spent 45 minutes in the bathroom. <laughs> he made sure every hair was in place. He made sure he'd had a shower. And he had enough stinkum on him to attract squirrels from five miles away. Isn't that right? <laughs> I guarantee you had to drive with the windows down to get there. You wouldn't have been able to breathe. <laughs> Bring her flowers again. Take her out. Do something sweet for her to show her affection, men. Because that's hard. We talk all the time about how she should respect us. Try acting respectable. You know, let's just try doing that. Why do you think God gave the different commandments? You know, uh, the, it, and, and maybe, maybe there's a reason why God had to tell husbands to love their wives. Maybe there's a reason why God had to tell wives to respect their husbands. And from what I've observed, it's because this is the area where we seem to have the most trouble. All the time. 1 Peter 3, 7 warns husbands, if you don't love your wife, God's not going to hear your prayers. That sounds pretty important. I want God to hear my prayers. That's not conditioned on me staying married to my wife. That's conditioned on me loving my wife. So I better work on that, right? That's an important thing. Proverbs 31 says, The husband of the noble woman sits at the gate in a place of respect. 
Why is he there? Because behind every successful man is a really good woman. Proverbs 14 and verse 1 says that a woman can make or break her husband. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. Oh, we need those things. We need that kind of teaching. We'll finish up here as Jesus is going to lay out God's plan very, very succinctly. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew 19. I've got the text up here, and uh, I don't know if you can see it at the back. I tried to make it all on one page, so it may, it may be small to read at the very back, but I hope you can read this. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by saying, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He, this is Jesus, answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So look at what Jesus says here. Jesus tells us about God's plan for marriage. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife? Here's his answer. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? You either have an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. You can think whatever you want to think about who you think you are, but God made you either male or female from the very beginning. That was part of God's plan, and we need to understand it. Jesus reiterated that. He goes on, he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. By the way, when, when two people get married, their families don't get married. You may marry into somebody else's family. I have a loving family and hugging, and, and they want Gail to be their sister, and sometimes Gail says they squish her with their love. She doesn't. So, uh, some families are not that way at all. Some families are totally separate. Leave and cleave. I think sometimes it's very important that we leave and cleave. I, I remember my daughter calling us. Uh, she called me every single night uh, when she was in college. For me to tuck her in and then after she was married she called and called and finally one day I said sweetheart don't you think it's time you let Robin tuck you in at night you're married to him have been for over a month you know uh, and she quit calling me I don't know I wish she'd call uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. whatever it works that way sometimes we need to leave and cleave we need to realize that this is a new entity, this one flesh relationship with one another, and it doesn't involve our previous family. But he goes on. He says, they too are, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Let's make it very clear. We're not separate from each other anymore. We're one. We're one person. We're one entity. We're one couple. Couple, meaning joined together. We're joined together. So Jesus is making very sure that we understand that. He goes on. He says, What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Who joins us together as a couple? God. When we start a marriage ceremony, the, the traditional words are, Dearly beloved, we're gathered together in the sight of God and these witnesses to join this couple or to unite this couple in the bonds of holy matrimony. By the way, you hear the words there? In the sight of God and these witnesses to unite them in the bonds. We're tying them up. We're tying them up. That's the word there. We are tying them up in marriage. They're going to be tied together for all time. Uh, and, and, and that's the way it's supposed to be, to be tied together for the lifetime. That's God's plan. He goes on and said, well, why then did Moses command? There's a word. Moses command us to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed. Notice the difference between the word command and the word allowed. Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. Because your hearts are hard. Not because of her sin. Because your hearts are hard. Do you see that? That's what he says. Not because she committed adultery, 
because your heart is hard. Not because he was abusive, but because your heart is hard. Those are the grounds that Moses allowed for a divorce, according to Jesus. But from the beginning, it was not so. God's plan is for one man and one woman to spend one lifetime together. I'm not saying that if your spouse has been unfaithful to you and your spouse continues to be unfaithful to you, that you're required to stay married to her. No, in fact, the Bible says you, you have the right to be unmarried. I'm not saying that if your spouse is abusive to you and he puts you in the hospital two or three times that you need to stay in a house where you're not safe. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that God's plan is that we try to stay married for the rest of our lives. By the way, make a whole lot of difference who we're choosing when we're married if we looked according to God's plan in the first place. Might avoid a lot of those problems on the back end. You see, Jesus made it very clear. Marriage is a God thing. It's not a man thing. In fact, man didn't even think about it. Man was alone, and God looked at man and said, it's not right for man to be alone. And so he created a wife for him because God said it was right. And it's what it, the way it was supposed to be from the very beginning. When we commit ourselves to God and obey him in our vows, we're going to have a happy effect on our children, on our grandchildren, and on the community we live in. And we're going to have a more happy life for ourselves. Fred Smith, an author, told this story. He said, one of my most treasured memories comes from a donut shop in Grand Saline, Texas. There was a young farm couple sitting at the table next to mine. He was wearing overalls and she a gingham dress. After finishing their donuts, he got up to pay the bill and I noticed that she didn't get up and follow him. Then he came back and stood in front of her. She put her arms around his neck and he lifted her up, revealing that she was wearing a full body brace. He lifted her out of her chair, backed out the front door to the pickup truck with her hanging from his neck. As he gently placed her in the truck, everyone in the shop watched silently. No one said a word until a waitress remarked almost reverently, he really took his vows seriously. For better or for worse, in sickness and in health, in good times and the bad times, when things are easy and when things are difficult, till death do us part. That's God's plan for marriage. I can't say anything different than that because the scriptures are replete with this same description of marriage over and over and over again. So let me encourage you today. If your marriage isn't strong enough yet, make sure it's focused on God first. And husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Treat them with respect. It'll get better. And it shall. And young people, if you haven't found that person yet, or other folks, and there are plenty here who decided a long time ago, this just didn't for me. And that's okay. God didn't say you have to get married. There's no rule in the Bible that says you must get married or you're going to hell. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? I've had friends my whole life that some of them made the decision they didn't want to get married. This is not for them. But for those of us who are married, it'll make us better people. And it'll make us happier if we can just follow God's plan for our marriage. Maybe this morning you're not a child of God. And I know I didn't talk a whole lot about Jesus going to the cross and dying for you. But God loved you so much. He sent his son to die for you, and, and there's hope for you. You can be baptized into Christ. This last week at camp, we had a young man who's studying to be a leader in the church at some point who decided it was time for him to put on Jesus in baptism because he wanted to live for Christ for the rest of his life. How cool is that? Maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe you're a child of God and you haven't been living the way you ought to live and you need to come back. Maybe you need prayers. Maybe you've got something else going on in your life. If you need to respond, won't you come while we stand and sing to encourage?